Uh, welcome. My name is Thomas Bespo. I'm the uh, resident writing consultant at the uh, CBS Library, which is where we are today. Um, in this sort of uh, spacey environment that we have uh, designed, very expensive spacey environment that we are going to use today. Um, and this is, as you may know, the first in a series of talks. Uh, after this session, um, and the people who are participating online um, already know because they got the link from there, but after this session, I will send out uh, just like a, a follow-up mail and to make sure you have the link to all the coming sessions as well. Um, the idea of the series is that this is called the art of learning. And so it's sort of an informal um, talk about um, what it means to go to university, um, what it means to learn something, what it means to today, especially what it means to know something. Uh, and we'll unpack that in lots of different ways. Um, the idea for each of these talks will be roughly the same. The program will be about the same. What usually happens uh, from sort of experience doing a similar series of lectures last uh, year uh, is that I talk for about an hour. Uh, you are more than welcome to jump in if you have any questions or concerns. One of the things that uh, I really find useful is if I say something that makes no sense, if it seems odd, uh, or unexpected, um, then it's a really good idea just to say, that sounds odd or unexpected, because then I can get a chance to explain how you misunderstood it, right? Uh, or perhaps what I should learn. Right? So um, make sure that you, uh, that you just jump in. It is an informal setting, as you can see. There are goodie bags for anybody that uh, wants a library goodie bag. Uh, sorry, we couldn't send them out to the people uh, online. Um, so uh, yeah, so what are we gonna do? Uh, today, we're gonna talk about uh, one important element of learning, uh, probably the central element. I wanna raise this theme, right? Of uh, what does it mean to learn something? Well, it means to acquire knowledge. And so we're gonna talk about what knowledge is and we're gonna talk about how to know things. Right? That's the, uh, the theme for today. I'm gonna to put my phone on, uh, on uh, do not disturb. Okay, I should put it on full airplane mode so that we will not be disturbed. Um, like I say, my name is Thomas Bespool. I'm the resident writing consultant. And what that also means is that if, there, if you have any questions about your writing or really anything that comes out of these sessions, you are more than welcome to contact me. I usually say this quietly when we're in the library, uh, but like any librarian, I'm a lonely person. So you're allowed to uh, disturb me uh, um, and uh, make my day uh, meaningful by asking questions uh, by mail or you know, even just dropping in. Sometimes I'm even upstairs in the library. Um, what I want to do is something that uh, some of you uh, may already be familiar with if you have run into me in your courses uh, or anything like that. But I'm going to kind of work through it in great detail um, over the next eight sessions. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is start with a picture I draw. Um, and uh, you're welcome to try to guess what it is. Uh, I'm going I'm to draw it over here. Right? So um, some of you will immediately recognize what that is. You will recognize this as a... as an iceberg, right? Uh, and why we like to start with an iceberg when we're writing is that, um, is that Ernest Hemingway used to say, uh, the dignity of the movement of an iceberg lies in only one eighth of it being above water. So your writing has dignity, has gravitas, if you will, has seriousness, insofar as there's something under the surface, right? It's a surface, it's a very super, text is very superficial, right? So you're always trying to indicate that there's something underneath that that's actually carrying it, supporting it. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna really expand on this metaphor. Uh, so it's not just writing that we have on the surface, we're really gonna unpack this so that we have lots of things on the surface. We have a performance of something. Uh, for Hemingway, uh, what he would say is that you have um, under the surface, you have experience. 
right? Uh, so if you're gonna tell a story, if you're gonna tell somebody a story and it has to have dignity, right? You have to be telling it from your own experience. You have to, if you wanna talk about, you wanna write a story about the war, you should probably have some experience with war. If you want to write about bullfighting, you should have some experience with bullfighting, right? That, that would be his kind of underlying. If you want to have, if you want to write a love story, you should have some experience with love, right? Uh, so that's all. These are all quite important uh, things for for Hemingway. Um, in academic settings, we sometimes think my own personal experience isn't actually that important, or it seems frowned upon, or it's kind of marginalized. Uh, our personal experience isn't going to be playing the central role. We have to read all these books, so we have to collect data and so forth, right? So there's got to be a different basis we're going to have for, for, for the dignity of our performance, right, of our competence. And we can actually really think about this um, in terms of there is actually an experience that's real when you're doing, when you're doing, when you're at university, right? And one of them is collecting data on field work or doing interviews or anything like that, especially here at CBS, lots of students will be somehow gathering data, either from a database sometimes, or sometimes they'll be going out and doing interviews or they'll be doing uh, uh, surveys, or they even do field work. They'll go out and observe people, right? And what are they doing? Well, they're collecting data. Right? So their personal firsthand experience of walking and going around and doing stuff in the world and being embarrassed about things and being successful and all this kind of stuff, like an ordinary human kind of activity. What they're doing is they're gathering things that are like what, what Shakespeare would call sterner stuff, data, right? More serious versions of experience, things we can refer to and take for given, actually what data means, right? So one of the ways of thinking about this is, okay, you're still gonna have all these experiences. They're gonna be ordinary human experiences. They're gonna involve being a person in the world, right? Uh, but part of it is going to be, you know, create field notes or interview transcripts or um, spreadsheets full of data you've extracted from uh, a date like a database like Bloomberg or something like that, right? So there's just lots of, lots of your experience is physical real experience that gives you something, data, that you can take for granted in your analysis, right? So when you're doing an analysis, right, you can take your data for granted. So what about this experience? Where does it go? How does this become something you talk to other people about? How does it become part of your story? Well, it becomes part of your method, right? So you explain your experiences by um, way of your method, right? You In your method section or in your methodology, you're gonna talk about that. And then there's the question of how did you decide what to do, where to look, what questions to ask, right? How did you decide what kind of knowledge you would, what kind of data you would gather, what kind of process you would have? Well, um, you probably uh, uh, did some reading in the literature. You may even have talked to your librarians, right? And then you may have, uh, you may have uh, done a literature review of some kind, or you've just been given readings in your courses. So you're gonna be reading things that are part of the scientific literature, right? Um, and of course that will inform your theory, right? So we're gonna have a, up here, we're going to have some theory, uh, some method, and some analysis, and so forth. And then there's some other things that are just really worth considering, right? Is that you will also be sometimes developing a background for your research question or for the kind of problems you're dealing with. And that will be based on some sort of documentation, right? You want to make sure that there's some white papers or newspaper reports, right? Or company reports, something that you can refer to to kind of have dignity when you're talking about the overall kind of practical background of your research. And notice this, what we're looking at here, right? we're saying, okay, well, there's, there's some part of our knowledge here, some part of what's under the surface is definitely going to be reading, right? So keep that in mind, there's gonna be some reading uh, and that is going to shape your experience. 
right? You're gonna take this reading in and it's gonna change your mind. It's gonna change your way of looking at the world, right? And that's part of your knowledge. That new way of looking at the world is part of your knowledge. Right? Uh, it's gonna change the way you look at the world, how you collect data and so forth. Uh, and then there's this thing that you will all often have in your writing which will be the discussion section of a paper, right? Uh, you'll be asked to discuss. There's one course I'm involved in that, uh, that repeatedly asks students to theorize, analyze, and discuss, right? Take something and then theorize, analyze, and discuss it. Right? Theory, analysis, analysis, and discussion. And then we can ask ourselves, so on what basis, what's this white spot here? What is this empty part of the iceberg that we're gonna base our discussion on? Um, and this is really, really important not to, um, not to undervalue, right? We're gonna say that we have to be able to reason about our experience, right? So there's a lot of reading, right? That we do at university. We do actually use actual experience. We have experiences, we make observations, we collect data and so forth. So don't undervalue that. There is a real empirical component to learning something, right? But we're rational be beings, right? We think, right? So we have all of this as well, right? So please keep that in mind. Um, and that's usually, this will support you in all of this as well. You're gonna use your reason to help you figure out what you're reading and so forth, right? But it will definitely come out when you're starting to think about the implications of the work you're doing, right? So think about this, kind of complexity. And then what we're gonna to try to do now um, is walk, walk through this in a way that makes it, um, I, guess, I guess maybe a little more philosophical. And this is going to be kind of an outline of the various things we're gonna do in the eight talks uh, as we go forward. Um, uh, but, uh, but I want you to keep this in mind that what's really down here in the iceberg sort of in practical concrete terms is your awareness of the documentation, right? Uh, your awareness of the literature, and just kind of in a in round figures, you can say there are some databases that are good for this, right? Uh, here in the library, and there are some other databases that are good for getting around in this, right? And contact your librarians, look for courses and so forth that will help you gain access to the reading material, right? That will help you develop a background for your knowledge and help you understand the theory, master the theory, right? Um, remember to do this carefully, right? Really what experience here is methodological experience. What it really is, is what I did and why I did it, right? So keep track of what are you doing to learn things about the world, right? And why am I doing it that way, right? Why am I not just doing it some other way? Why am I not just following my gut, right? Why am I doing these specific things to learn something about the world, right? Um, so keep that experience in mind and then keep this reason in mind and keep in mind that it's a, a complicated, messy kind of thing, but it's going to be under the surface of your writing, right? Of your performance or your oral examination or just your conversations with your teachers and each other, right? It's gonna be under the surface and then you bring it into this orderly shape by talking about your background and your theories and your methods and you're presenting your analysis and then discussing the implications and this kind of thing, right? So you bring order to it, right? Uh, but really it's a big messy thing under the water. Right? Good, I hope if I move over here, we're still, yeah, good, all right. So I'm gonna draw another iceberg. And remember to jump in at any time if there are any issues, anything you want to talk about. Um, and then remember this thing that Hemingway emphasized and I also talked a little bit about, right? Like you'd, you'd want to have experiences if you're going to talk about or write about or sort of appear knowledgeable about something, right? But at university, we're going to call all of this knowledge, right? We're going to say it's not just experience. It's this complex of things that together is knowledge, right? And what you want to be is a knowledgeable person, right? So you want to be, like I said in the invite to this thing, uh, that means you want to be knowledgeable in the sense you want to be able to know things, like you want to be good at knowing things, 
and you want to be enabled by that knowledge to do something, right? You want to make sure that that knowledge is actually a competence. It's not just something I have and something I have to prove to my examiners I have. It's something that actually makes me better at something than I would have been if I didn't have this knowledge, right? Um, and so what does it make you better at? That's a really good question. What is knowing, why is it, why is it good to know things? Right? Why is it good to be knowledgeable? Uh, and my suggestion is there's really three things that um, knowledge makes you good at. Right? One of them is to think. And we'll talk about that, right? Uh, in fact, there's a whole talk, how to think uh, that I will do. We'll talk about that. There's an, and we'll, but we'll talk a little bit about it today also. Another one, of course, is speaking. And then there is the thing that I like to think I'm an expert in, writing. And I'm not gonna dominate the discussion with that or any of these sessions with that, but it is something we'll come back to again and again. Right? So if you are knowledgeable, you are better able to think about the things you know something about, which is say the issues in your discipline, right? You are better able to speak about those issues, right? And you are better able to write about them than ordinary ignoramuses. See? Than ordinary uh, people who don't know the things that you know. And we are all ignoramuses about some things. We're all non-specialists, uneducated about some things. But then there are some things that we've specifically got in a university education uh, to be knowledgeable about, right? And uh, so we're going to talk about this. Uh, one of the things that I have noticed in developing the program for these talks is that um, this is, there's sort of a, a background extra component that we don't think about when we think we got to be good at thinking, we got to be good at speaking, and we've got to be good at writing, right? And some of the stuff that has come out here as well. Right, is that if you're good at thinking, you're actually good at getting your feelings under control. You're also precise in feeling. You understand where your feelings belong, right? Doesn't mean you get rid of them. <laughs> it just means you take them in, and use them in an effective way, right? So the ability to think is also to a certain extent, right? Or connected to an ability to feel. And we'll get back to that in the talk on how to enjoy things. Right, which I think is a really, really important component of going to university, right? Is not just showing up and succeeding, but leaving university having enjoyed it and not just having enjoyed the obviously fun things, right? But having enjoyed the actual core university mission. Right? So uh, that's one of the things I would definitely encourage you to, um, to keep in mind. If you're gonna speak well, you have to be able to listen. Right. Uh, for those following along online and who can't read what I'm writing, uh, there will be clearer slides uh, that I'll develop as we go as well. Um, so if you're going to speak, you're probably also going to have to listen. And if you're going to write, this is where we've already got this over here, you're probably also going to have to read, right? And we're going to go through each of those things, right? We'll do a separate talk on how to feel, like how to enjoy things, how to listen during your lectures and during the conversations you're having, right? or how to read, often very difficult texts, right? So we're gonna figure out how to do that. And that will of course connect to your ability to think, your ability to speak, and your ability to write, right? So here's where it gets, uh, I think, interesting. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is, I think it's gonna go quite well. Uh, like I say, we'll go for about another half hour. We'll take a break. And then we have an hour for questions if we want. Uh, so and that goes for people online and for, for you here as well. Um, so uh, who would we go to to ask, uh, what does it mean to be good at thinking, right? Now, some of you may be thinking we would go to psychologists, about that, right? But you're talking to a trained philosopher and I have some pride in uh, that particular area. So we are actually gonna ask philosophy what it means uh, to think, right? So we're gonna take a quick little walk through that. And there, then we will of course leave that for the full one hour talk on how to think.
what about uh, speaking? Well, uh, when we speak, uh, we go to rhetoricians. The uh, rhetoricians are people who are really, really good at understanding the competence of eloquence, speaking well. Right? It's a whole, there's a tradition that's just as long as the philosophers. Um, as the philosophical tradition that is all about speaking eloquently and properly and well, right? So when asked the philosophers or the rhetoricians what they think, um, I'm not as trained in rhetoric as I am in philosophy, but I was married to a rhetorician for quite a few years, uh, which was a wonderful experience, uh, if she's listening. Uh, and uh, so I, I feel I have some confidence in this one. And I'll say some elementary things. Um, and then, of course, there's this, uh, who do we ask about writing? Well, we go to the literature, right? There's a literary competence, right? So what we want to be is we want to be, uh, want to be uh, philosophically, rhetorically uh, competent, and we want to be literate, right? We want to have a literary competence, right? Uh, so we want to become literate about what we are, uh, what we're doing. Um, does that make sense so far? Right. Uh, in kind of slogans, and slogans are good to help you remember things and so forth, right? Uh, thinking really, the ability to think is just the ability to make up your mind, right? To be presented with, usually at a business school, it'll be, you'll be presented with a case, for example, right? Uh, or you'll be presented with some sort of problem or a set of data, right? And because you're knowledgeable, because you have understood the course that you're participating in, and now you've been given this case within that course, right? you are able to make up your mind about what's going on in that case, right? If you gave the same case to me, who had not taken a course and has no competence in finance or marketing right, or organization studies or whatever it is, right? Then I would not be able to make up my mind about what's important in this case, right? What the issues are, right? But you will be able to make up your mind because you can think. Um, and so the question then to, to us or to the philosopher, I suppose, is what is, what, how do we make up our minds? Or what does it mean to make up our minds? What does it mean to arrive at a made up mind? Right? And a philosopher will say, well, that means you're going to have a belief. Right? So what's gonna, so the ability to make up your mind is really the ability to form a belief. And by belief, I don't really just mean opinion, but I, what I mean is a kind of what philosophers sometimes call a propositional attitude. Right? So you're gonna make up your mind in the sense of you will have an idea about what's going on in the world, what's actually going on in the world, what the matter of fact in the world is, right? So you'll hold a belief about the world. Okay? Um, and I hope you've all done this, You've all, you all believe things right now, probably, right? Some things you believe, some things you've chosen not to believe. That's a belief too, right? You believe that that is not true, right? You know that people think certain things that you don't believe is true. Um, but I hope you've also had the following experience. It's one that I very often emphasize. It's a really important one, right? It is, you form a, you spend some time, you study the question seriously, form a belief, Right? You make up your mind. And then a few weeks pass and you get more information. And you discover that the belief you had formed was wrong. Right? This has hopefully happened to you. I usually say, if it hasn't, go and do it. <laughs> go and have this experience. It's a good one. Right? Um, and what a philosopher will do is jump on that and say, uh, aha, right? that proves that any old belief won't do. You can't just uh, believe and then think you know something. You have to have a particular kind of belief uh, and they have a word for it. It has to be true, right? So if you wanna know something, you have to make up your mind, you have to form a belief, but you have to do it well. You have to do it right, right? If you do it wrong, then you get a false belief. If you do it right, you get a, a true belief. Um, and we are going, we are actually going to unpack this in the how to think lecture a little bit about what truth is, but today I'm just going to leave it at, it's the opposite of being wrong, <laughs> right? So having a true belief is the opposite of being wrong. So you have the relevant experience already, right? Um, well, we can of course spend an entire 
you could spend, you could be a philosophy student and spend your entire studies deciding what the truth is, right? What that means. And then you could say, um, what else do you want? Right? Uh, you've got to believe, and it's true. What more could you possibly need to be knowledgeable? And this is an important um, thing to, to put in uh, to, your, to your package. You're welcome to come in if you. Um, so this is an important thing to add to your, to your, uh, to your confidence, uh, which is that uh, some beliefs, even though they're true that we form, uh, aren't good enough. And the best example I have of this is you are probably over the next 20 minutes or so, or maybe you already have, uh, formed a belief, made up your mind about me, about whether I'm a trustworthy character. Right? Uh, and some of you, you know, because you're listening to me and you may want, you're trying to decide whether to come back, right? So you're thinking, you know, does he know what he's talking about? Right? So let's suppose uh, that you have made up your mind that uh, I know what I'm talking about when it comes to how to learn uh, the art of learning, right? Um, I can tell you right away that you formed a true belief. So that's good. So far, so good. Uh, I do know what I'm talking about. But then suppose somebody says, well, I was also at the session and uh, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. I think he's putting us on. I don't trust him. Right? And so you have to defend this opinion you have, this belief you have about me. And then suppose you say, didn't you notice? Thomas has a beard. Bearded men are to be trusted. Right? Um, so you formed a belief, it's a true belief, and you've offered you know, your reasons for thinking so. Right? Um, but we all know that there's something wrong with the argument I just made. Thomas has a beard, therefore he's to be trusted. Right? And the, the thing that's wrong with it is we have a nasty word for it. Right? Uh, it's a prejudice. Maybe a positive bias, right? It may even have arrived at a nice thing to say about Thomas, right? Uh, but it's just a prejudice, right? And it's not something we brag about when we say, this is why I trust Thomas. I trust him because he has a beard, right? That is not the usual way of arguing. So what a philosopher will say is that just goes to show not, old, not only will not old, any old belief do, any old true belief won't do either, right? So you need to have justified true beliefs. And then of course, there's a whole history and we'll talk more about this in the How to Think lecture. There's then a whole history of people saying, aha, well, now that we've gone down this road, is there a fourth thing? Is there, do they have to be beliefs that are true, justified and something more even than that, right? Can we come up with other counter examples where we have a justified true belief and we still don't want to say that's knowledge. We can go there, right? But we're not going to go there today, right? Uh, we're just going to say that this is a really good little heuristic to have when you're trying to decide, did I learn something today? Right? Did I acquire knowledge today? Well, did I form a justified true belief, right? Did I come to believe something I didn't previously believe, right? Was that thing that I came to believe true? <laughs> it's a good thing to kind of just think about that for a second, right? And do I know why it's true? And those reasons that I give myself for saying it's true, are they credible reasons? Are they good reasons? Right? Do I think that that's a good way of forming beliefs? Right? And of course, there's a social component to justification as well. Is it something my peers would take seriously? Right? Is it something my teachers would approve of? Right? That kind of thing. Right? Does that make sense? Um, so there's lots of people uh, who are jam-packed full of justified true beliefs. Uh, some of them were your teachers, actually. Uh, but certainly at university, you'll meet lots of people who are uh, who walk around in a daze because they have so much justified true belief, you wouldn't believe it. Right? Uh, and what you want to do is not get yourself in a very classic posture as an academic. Um, and there's, a, I don't know how many of you watch Danish, classic Danish movies. There's a movie called The, uh, the One and Only, Den Ene is Den Ene, which has a character that has studied psychology for seven years. She's really, really smart about human relationships. Uh, but 
uh, she's not very good at explaining to her friends how they should run the relationships. She can't use her knowledge in conversations with her friends. She can just keep saying, listen to me, I've studied psychology for seven years, right? You can just feel sort of how burdened she is by knowledge. So for this reason, I suggest that you don't uh, satisfy yourself with justified your beliefs, no matter how justified and true they may be, right? Uh, it's not just about forming the right beliefs. Right? There's something else in your iceberg. There's something else in this competence that you want to develop. Um, and it is uh, at least this, another three things uh, that are going to define a competence. And this is what I, I like to define this as uh, being knowledgeable at university is being able to hold your own in a conversation with other knowledgeable people. And so if you know something in an academic environment, right, you know who the other knowledgeable people are, and you know that you can converse intelligently with them. Right? You're conversant in your discipline, in your field. And you want to make sure you're testing this all the time. Um, and it's a really great question, who are the other knowledgeable people? Right? Well, we could say, isn't that circular? <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm defining knowledge and I'm saying you have to be able to talk to other people who have knowledge. Right. Well, how do they know? And just remember that at a university, you can find them easily because they are your fellow students in your cohort. The other knowledgeable people that you want to be able to converse with intelligently right, are the other people who are in your program because right? they have the same readings. They've had the same class discussions, right? They've collected the same data, right? They've done some of the same things. They have a similar iceberg underneath their dignity, right? Uh, so you can converse with them and test yourself. Am I able to have a, a sustained, intelligent, interesting conversation with other people in my program? So do that, right? And then the question is, will there be three things that I can talk about? There, again, there's a whole, gonna be a whole talk about this, right? We'll do a whole talk on how to speak, right? How to talk. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so are there three things? And, and there are. I don't know if you've heard um, that there's no such thing as a stupid question and you've all discovered this to be a lie. Is that correct, right? Uh, because, of course, in a knowledge environment among knowledgeable people, there are certain questions that you wouldn't ask if you had, for example, read the text for that day's class, right? Uh, and so we've all experienced, we've sometimes done it ourselves, right? I know I have many times, right? Asked a question that one wouldn't have asked if one had really been at, on, at the level of the knowledge community at that time, right? So that there are such things as not very good questions. Right? And when I say this, I always emphasize that rhetorical competence right, isn't calling questions stupid. Right? So if somebody asks a bad question, you don't say that's a stupid question. Right? You seem to be ignorant right? because that ends the conversation. So that's not skill. That's not rhetorical competence. Right? That doesn't show you are able to speak intelligently with other knowledgeable people. Right? A truly knowledgeable person can just move the conversation away from that fruitless question. Right? And towards something more constructive. And sometimes the person that asks the question doesn't even notice that's what happened. Right? Because you're skilled in the manner of speaking knowledge knowledgeably and with other knowledgeable people. Right? Does that make sense? So like it, it is a serious thing. And one of the places you really work on this is when you're developing research questions. Because you're essentially saying, given everything we know at this point in the class, what's a good question? Right? What's still a good question? Even though we've studied it, we've read all these texts, we've had all these conversations, what's still interesting to ask? Right? Um, so keep that in mind. The other thing that I'm going to make uh, quite a big deal out of uh, next when we talk about this issue uh, uh, is that you have a shared sense of humor with your cohort. Right? There's certain things you begin to find funny, uh, certain jokes you begin to get that you didn't before get, right? And other things you begin to think are not so funny because you're starting to know something about the subject. Right? So there's certain stereotypes that no longer work because now you know how accountants really think. Right? So now accountants aren't so funny anymore, right? It's fine. 
right? That's one of the things that an education does for you. It changes your sense of humor a little bit, right? And that sense of humor is something you share with other knowledgeable people, right? So notice that as you're getting smarter, as you're getting more and more knowledgeable, more and more legitimate as a participant in a knowledge community, your sense of humor changes. Right? Probably the most famous example is uh, the Big Bang Theory, uh, like a sitcom about physicists. Uh, they think things are funny that nobody else gets, right? Uh, so that's, uh, and it's totally legitimate. And then there, I'm not gonna say a lot about this today, but you have to remember, especially in this age of controversy and canceling and so forth, right? Uh, that in any knowledgeable community, in any group of peers, right? Any group of serious thinkers, right? There are things that are not okay to say. Right? I was put on exclamation point with a warning. Right? There are things that mark you out as the wrong kind of person for this discipline. And it's not the same in every discipline. So organization theories have kind of one set of values, right? And economists have another set of values and they have a different kind of set of values, right? So you've noticed this when you are maybe at the bar on Thursdays or whatever, right? That when you, you meet somebody from another discipline, from finance, you know, you're an organization theorist or a psychologist, you meet somebody from finance, you think a little bit differently about the world, right? They have a, they have a noticeably different sense of value. Um, so keep that in mind and learn how to deal with controversies like that in a constructive way, right? Don't be scared of it. Um, but also be careful, I guess is the, the right way to put it, right? Be careful with it. Uh, and then especially in among your peers, when you are trying to have conversations and trying to learn how to speak intelligently to each other, um, make sure that you uh, are kind to each other and you let each other make mistakes, right? Because the only way you're gonna learn this is by trying things, right? So don't call each other evil. Don't call each other stupid, right? Don't groan at everybody's jokes all the time and say they're unfunny and not entertaining, right? Let people try to develop their questions, their sense of the good question, their sense of humor, and their sense of value, right? Like let people develop this over time. The educa your education is gonna change you, right? But what it's gonna do is it's gonna make you good at conversing, right? It's gonna make you conversant in your discipline. Um, good. So uh, you probably all know people that seem to be really good at making up their minds about things and really good at talking about them. Right? And uh, you may be these people, and uh, I certainly admire them. Uh, you know, it's great to be the kind of person that can get into a situation, make up their mind, understand what's going on, and then talk intelligently about it and defend their points of view and so forth. Right? So that's certainly competence and it's certainly respect, uh, certainly worthy of our respect and it contributes to the dignity of our iceberg. But uh, at university, you don't want to be satisfied with just being able to make up your mind and talk about it, right? Making up your mind and speaking your mind is not good enough, right? It's great, you should be able to do it, uh, but it's not good enough. So what you wanna do is have a third competence and this competence, uh, I like to define in lots of different ways, right? And I'm just gonna emphasize three points about it. And then in the actual how to write talk, I'll get into all the nitty gritty details about this, right? Um, but being knowledgeable at a university, knowing something at a university, right? Is the ability to compose a coherent prose paragraph about it. And some of you who've been in my writing workshops, right, know exactly what I mean by that, right? A paragraph is at least six sentences long and at most 200 words that says one thing and supports, elaborates, or defends. Defends that claim. And remember, it's a paragraph, right? So for everything you know, everything you learn during your studies, what you wanna do is develop um, a competence, which is just composition. And what it says is I'm able to bring to mind 
an idea that I have, belief I hold, just a true belief that I hold, right? I'm able to articulate that belief in a sentence that I know to be true, right? And when I look at that sentence, I feel justified, right? I accurately feel like I have a reason to believe this, right? I have reasons to believe it. So I can put it in a nice, simple declarative sentence. Sense-making is a retrospective process. The uh, internet has changed the way customers communicate with businesses, right? True sentences, right? Things that you may or may not know something about, right? And that's what you do. You try to be knowledgeable in this particular sense that what you wanna do is you wanna be able to, in writing, support, elaborate, or defend that kind of claim. And whenever you are trying to decide whether to support, elaborate, or defend, okay, what you want to do is think about your reader. This is something Virginia Woolf said, knowing who you're writing for is knowing how to write. So this is a, one of the things that I really want to stress about going to university, because it is school, right? There's no way around that. It is school. You do go to exams. You get tested, right? Um, but um your the 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 who that you're writing for your reader right is not your examiner and not your teacher right you're always when you're writing academically you're always writing for peers so you're writing for the same people you're trying to have these conversations with right does that make sense so what you want to do is be in a position not just to recognize good questions tell a funny joke be a little witty right uh, and handle controversial material, right? Or stay away from it as you choose, right? Um, what you wanna do is be in a position to support, elaborate, or defend each of your justified true beliefs in writing. And by that you mean in a paragraph, by which you mean at least six sentences worth of writing and at most 200 words. And a great way to think about that is 200 words is about one minute of your reader's attention, right? So think about forming your ideas in such a way that you can present them to a willing person, right? Somebody who sat down and decided, I'm gonna read this text, right? And they're gonna read it and you're gonna occupy one minute at a time and you're gonna know what you're gonna do with that minute of their time. And during that minute, you'll take something that they find a little bit hard to believe and you'll support it with evidence some kind, either with sources that say it's true, right? Or data that underpins what you're saying, right? Or you will elaborate it. You will say what you mean because they have they, they find it a little bit difficult to understand, right? So the thing that they're saying may be a little bit hard to believe or a little bit hard to understand. But you know, because you've chosen what to say, that give me a minute and give me a well-educated peer in my cohort who takes this stuff seriously, Right? I can get them to believe it or get them to understand it. Right? Just give me a minute of their time and these 184 words or whatever it is, right? that's how we're going to present it. The defend one is the most interesting one. I'll say a lot about that in the how to write talk, right? but uh, it basically says, uh, I think about what I want to say to the reader. I think about my reader and I think, wait a minute, my reader has thought about this too. Right? My reader has read this text as well. And my reader has arrived at a different conclusion than I have about what this text says, right? Or what's going on in the world on this, or what the relationship between customers and businesses really is after the internet, right? So I'm going to say something that I think is true, but I'm going to imagine a reader that I imagine that I think disagrees with me. So I'm going to defend myself, right? I'm going to spend one minute of my reader's time not attacking the reader. Right? You don't have time to attack the reader. You only have a minute. You can't convince them you're right. right? So what you're going to do instead is you're going to defend the reasonableness of your view. Right? You're going to explain to the reader why you think what you think. Right? And you're going to acknowledge that the reader thinks differently. And so you're in a defensive posture. Right? So that's a perfectly reasonable place to be for one minute of your writing. Does that make sense? So again, I'll say much more about this in the actual how to write lecture, but uh, just, to, just so you have it now, right? If you really wanna develop this skill, remember that you know, pretty much anybody can write a paragraph about one thing that is true, right? 
given infinite amounts of time or given an unlimited amount of time, right? What you want to do to really, before you say you know something, right, is you want to say, I'm able to make up my mind about it. I'm able to talk intelligently about it. And I'm able to compose a coherent prose paragraph about it in 27 minutes, right? And I say that, and I realize that kind of sounds kind of arbitrary, but it's important to keep in mind that you want to give yourself, it could be 18 minutes if you want, right? Uh, but the great thing about 18 and 27 minutes is that it's 18 minutes plus a two minute break or 27 minutes plus a three minute break. That's two or three paragraphs an hour, right? And that's just something you want to know you can do. And so you want to train yourself to have the kinds of ideas and parcel them out in such a way that they can be organized into paragraphs that you can compose in a reasonable amount of time. And in that amount of time, you can write something that a reader can understand uh believe or not agree with but um find more agreeable after you're done with them for that minute right so that's what you want to you want to you want to develop that skill of course the only way to develop that skill is to practice right? it actually goes for all of these skills you want to make up your mind every day deliberately test yourself do i believe it is it true right to justify actually that's something i missed when i talked about this um please, please, please uh, don't forget this step of actually believing it. There's a tendency at university and researchers have this tendency as well when they're writing for publication uh, is to focus on whether or not it's true and justified rather than whether or not they actually believe it, <laughs> right? So take this step, right? If you think it's true and justified, right? Internalize it, make it part of your beliefs. Right? Uh, because that'll be much, it'll be much easier to carry around as a belief than just as this sort of orthodox position you know is there, right? So internalize it as an actual belief. Right? Um, and then of course, understand your justifications and so on. Great. Now, so we're reaching the end of the, of the hour and then we'll take a break. Uh, and of course, in the break, you're free to, to go. Uh, and if there's nobody here, when I get back from the break, including online, including i should say including online um then uh then um i will of course go home uh but uh i'm willing to stay until five o'clock and answer any questions you have right so uh, keep that in mind um yeah sure also, why did you get this number of 27 minutes? <laughs> so the 27 minutes, uh, so I do, you know, I consider myself a writing consultant. So it is kind of like any other consultant. It's sort of a combination of experience and science and bullshit, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's a memorable thing. Like you'll remember 27 minutes, so that's kind of nice. Um, it's a good way of organizing your time into half hours, including a break. So if you end up with 25 minutes in your practice, I'm not gonna you know, complain about that. Uh, but if you say, well, I write paragraphs in anywhere between 10 minutes and 40 minutes, right? Then I'm gonna say, well, maybe be a little more disciplined, be a little more organized, right? So that you have the same measure for every paragraph. Um, it's uh, at least six sentences, but at most 200 words. So you're talking about usually between 100 and 200 words. Uh, between 100 and 200 words. Um, and, and it'll be between six and usually 12 sentences. Uh, and it's not six sentences and 200 words, because those are long sentences. Don't, don't think that. And it's not uh, support elaborate and defend. It's support, elaborate, or defend, for the most part. Every paragraph is a little bit impure. There's going to be a little bit of everything in every paragraph. But what you want to do is have a focus. Right? You really want to say, what is the one thing I'm really trying to do with this paragraph? Right? Um, yeah, and then you said uh, you wanted kind of a, so the connection between them. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so being knowledgeable at a university right, is taking all of this mess that we have all of these sources of knowledge right, that we want to talk about, right? uh, which means different kinds of reading material, different kinds of experience, 
empirical, some of it's personal, right? Some of it is just more, you know, just methodological, method, methodical, sorry. Uh, and a lot of reasoning, right? You take all of that, put it together. And then what you wanna do is say, um, on the surface of your knowledgeability, right? The fact that you're knowledgeable, right? Um, is this performance, right? This thing you're able to do better than most people within your, so within your discipline, right? You are able to do this better than people outside of your discipline, right? You're able to make up your mind about something, which is to say, think. You're able to speak your mind about it, and you're able to write it down, right? And you just wanna make sure that you have those three things. You're able to make up your mind, you're able to speak your mind, and you're able to write it down. Um, and uh, again, uh, you will, there will be links, there will be a whole page that kind of summarizes everything I'm talking about for each of these talks. So I'll, all of it will be summarized like that. Um, and then please keep this in mind. Um, for, for different people, it's different, right? But keep in mind that it's all three things, right? It's not one of them and then you know something. And so you're gonna say, well, this one, this one I know how to talk about and this one I know how to write down. <laughs> you wanna say for everything you know, you know all three, you can do all three, you have all three competences. Right? And what that means is that when you sit down to write, you feel the strength of all the other competencies you have. You feel the strength of your ability to think, you feel the strength of your ability to speak and you feel as confident writing as you would speaking and thinking about it, right? And for some people, that's what they need. They need to remind themselves that there's good at the, there's strong in the writing moment as they are in the thinking and speaking moments. But of course, for other people, it's completely different, right? Some people are really good at thinking and writing, right? This is where they love to be. But this one, they don't like. <laughs> they don't like standing in my shoes right now, right? They think this is, this is hell, right? Other people think this is hell. Some people put them, you know, alone in a chair and tell them to think, and they think it's hellish. I need, I can do these two things, right? But I can't just sit and think, right? Um, but everybody needs to work on it, right? So everybody needs to say, well, where am I strong? And then I'm going to draw from that strength. So my ability, my philosophical and rhetorical dignity, I'm going to draw on to establish a literary dignity, right? And if I don't have any rhetorical dignity, right, if I'm just nervous and can't speak in public and so forth, right, um, if I don't feel I'm good at this, then I'm going to draw on the fact that I have philosophical and literary dignity to build strength here, right? And I'm going to, of course, choose small situations to start with, right? I'll bring a small group of uh, fellow students together and I'll talk to them for 10 minutes, right? So, you know, I'll practice that, right? I'll sit down for 18 minutes and write a paragraph. Right, all by myself. Nobody's watching, so it's not scary. Right, I'm going to practice drawing on that strength. Right? That's the way you want to do it. Okay? Um, and I think you'll find that if you just really see it as it's no different from learning how to play the piano, it's no different from learning how to draw a hand. As an example, I'll also use. Right, uh, it's no different from getting into shape. Right. Uh, some of you, you know how many push-ups you could do in a minute, right? Well, learn how many, how, what would come out of 27 minutes of writing as well. Right? And we all know that all of those skills develop um, just by doing, just by practicing, right? taking specific deliberate moments to train these skills. Right? So please, please do that. Um, and then the thing we're gonna get, get onto in the um, how to enjoy, how to enjoy it, uh, talk near the end, right, is uh, please, feedback is great, right, so getting feedback from your peers or getting feedback from your teachers is great, right, but I find a, too many students um, think they can't know if they're doing it right unless they get feedback, so they become dependent on it, so they'll write something and then they'll say, I have no idea if this makes any sense, I'll give it to somebody to read, does this make any sense, right, um, just remember that if you were practicing the piano or were learning how to draw or were getting into shape, right? Uh, you wouldn't need your coach to tell you 
that you're doing it, or that you're getting better, right? You're running every other day, 5K, right? You just feel better, right? Um, and it just gets easier, right? And you're playing the piano every day, right? You, you can hear and feel that you're getting better at this, right? So start with that. Start with that sort of first person qualitative feedback, which is just, I'm liking this more, right? This used to be really hard. It's getting easier, right? I used to hate the result. It's getting easier. It's getting, it's getting more enjoyable, right? I'm starting to like listening to myself talk, right? I'm starting to like reading my own writing, right? I'm starting to like being alone with myself and just having thoughts, right? Uh, and that's being, becoming a good academic, right? As somebody who can do those things and enjoy them. So I'll leave you with that, that uh, being good at something is also being able to enjoy it, right? So don't, you know, don't let your, don't say I'm good at it, I just hate it, <laughs> right? Now wait until you actually can find a way of enjoying it. That's part of the skill. Right? Good, so we'll take a, um, yeah, that was, sometimes timing just works out.